see you gathered out with us, as I say every week, uh, you can't beat uh, being out in, in person for worship. Uh, so we do trust that we will uh, know God's blessing as we meet uh, together to worship him here. And of course, if you join with us online, if you're with us on our Facebook page or our YouTube channel, uh, or indeed Drive 105, uh, it's good uh, to have you with us uh, as well. So just one announcement uh, for the Drive 105 listeners. Um, at the end of this month, uh, we're phasing that out. Uh, the radio station has asked uh, they're going to start discontinuing those services uh, on a Sunday afternoon. But the, the CDs uh, and the DVDs are still available, so if you still want to access that service and can't meet with us in person yet, uh, please just say so. Um, we'll get a copy of the CD out to you. Um, at the end of the service, the CDs are now made, or hopefully will be made at the end of the service down the back. We've moved the the copy are in here. So if you know someone who uh, could use that, that means use the CD each week. I uh, just asked the guys at the back there. It's great to see a few new helping hands down at the back there. Uh, and again, if you feel you could help out in that, if you're anyway uh, interested in, in technology or anything like that there, even if you're not, the, the guys uh, will show you what, what to do. If I can get a handle on it, anybody can get a handle on it. Um, but if you're interested, it would be good uh, to have a few more helping hands down there uh, as well. But please uh, just repeat that if you know someone who can't be out yet um, but uh, would benefit from a DVD or a CD, uh, please just ask uh, and we'll, we'll get that sorted for you. It's good uh, to have Rudy with us today. Uh, it's good that we are here uh, and able to celebrate uh, the sacrament of baptism again. So Rudy... Um, you going to sing with us this week again? Um, it's good uh, to have you and your family and friends with you for this very special day. Uh, and you're very welcome with us and worship here as well. But we are, as we say, here to worship. We're here uh, to worship God. And I want to read uh, another call to worship. I've been looking through my uh, Calvin Institute book again. And so I have a little uh, call to worship uh, from there. I think it's, it's good uh, to focus our minds as we come uh, to worship God. So let me just read uh, these words uh, to call us uh, to worship here today. He says, if you are spiritually weary and in search of rest, if you're mourning and you long for comfort, if you're struggling and you desire victory, if you recognize that you're a sinner and need a savior, God welcomes you here in the name of Christ. To the stranger in need of fellowship, to those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, and to whoever, whoever will come, this congregation opens wide its doors and welcomes all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because God, you are the sovereign one and rightly to be blessed. Your name shall ever be upon our lips. You have heard the poor and saved them from trouble. You have enlightened believers. Their faces reflect your radiance. And so a glow with the splendor of your promised redemption, we gather to worship you. Amen. Let us worship God together. We're going to stand. We're going to sing uh, that hymn that Mark uh, and Rebecca were singing for us there to remind us of it uh, this week. There is a higher throne than all this world has known. What better place uh, to start as we come to worship God than to look heavenward uh, to God and to that mighty throne. Let's, let's stand and let's worship God together.
Let's continue in worship together as we uh, commit our time to God in prayer. Let's, let's pray together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and Lord, we acknowledge the, the wonderful privilege it is to come and to meet in the name of Jesus to worship you. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come and to gather in this meeting house, to gather as your family and fellowship here to raise our voices, to lift our voices heavenwards, to sing our praise and worship to you, the Almighty God. Yes, Father, as we've just sung, what better way to open our service than to look heavenwards, to think of that mighty throne where you rule over all things, to focus our minds on that mighty throne where one day when Everything on this earth is brought to fulfillment that, Lord, we will be gathered around to sing praise, worship, and glory to you. And Father, as we come with those thoughts of heaven, as we come with those thoughts of worship on our minds, as we come with thoughts of your majesty and glory on our minds, Father, we recognize that what so often we come, Lord, we aren't worthy to even look near your throne, never mind approach it. We come with so much going on in our lives from the week has gone past so many times when we have failed you both in thought and in word and in deed. We come with so much cluttering our minds about the world and the things of the world and the things that will occupy our lives in the week that lie ahead. And Father, as we come, Lord, we pray, Lord, for your forgiveness. Father, we thank you that you are a forgiving God. No matter how often we have strayed, no matter how often we have failed you, we thank you that we can know and experience your gracious forgiveness in each of our lives. Father, we pray, Lord, that that would be the motive for our worship here today. Lord, that we would come with thankful hearts, for all that you are and all that you've done for us. Father, we thank you for Jesus. So, Father, as we come, Lord, we pray that, yes, as we come with thankful and humble hearts, you would direct our worship today, Lord. We pray that in all that we do here today, Lord, whether it is singing our songs of worship, whether it's listening to your word, Lord, we pray that it would be indeed worthy of you and worthy, Lord, to be acceptable to you. So, Father, we commit this time of worship to you. And, Lord, we ask that as we seek to lift your name high, that you would indeed bless us. Lord, we pray that we would be a blessing to you. And, indeed, as we leave this place, that we would be a blessing to others. So, Father, guide and bless our time together, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to turn to God's Word uh, together now, as I always say, if you have your Bible with you. Uh, it's good to bring your Bible with you. It's good to open up God's Word and read it together. It will be coming up on, on the screen, but I want to encourage you. Uh, we are moving forward in, in our uh, lockdown procedures and our measures and stuff. Things are beginning to ease somewhat, uh, and I look forward to the time uh, when we can open up God's word together. But if you have your own Bible with you, whether here or at home, I encourage you to open up to Matthew chapter 7. And we're going to continue uh, reading through uh, our studies uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. This week, uh, moving on to those two little sections, Ask, Seek and Knock, and then those few verses, the narrow and wide gates. So let's read God's word uh, together. Matthew chapter 7, reading from verse 7. Ask and it will be given to you, Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? 
So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. Amen. We end our reading there at verse 14. And we trust uh, that God will indeed speak to us uh, as we turn to that uh, later on together. But as I said in our opening, it's wonderful to be able to celebrate uh, the sacrament of baptism together. So I'm going to move down uh, to the font here. If you just give me a, a little minute. All dressed up here, really. Get my visor on for ready to pull it off. You can see me better now. I can find my pages here now. Folks, it is good uh, to be able to celebrate uh, the sacrament together, as I've been joking with many folk. Uh, lockdown has been good to us. Um, but of course, it has meant uh, we've been only been able to celebrate uh, the sacrament like this together under certain circumstances and at certain times. Uh, and so we do, we seem to be, to be celebrating it uh, quite a, a bit recently, but that's obviously because of those restrictions that were placed on us in the past. And of course, now uh, with restrictions still in place, we're still only able to, to have one baptism uh, at a time. And I think that's good as well, because it makes... Uh, your day special uh, as well. So by now, uh, we should be all well aware of what we believe about baptism uh, as part of the Reformed faith uh, of the Presbyterian Church. In the Old Testament, circumcision was the sign of God's blessing of salvation promised in the covenant made with Abraham. In the New Testament, baptism then is the sign of the new covenant and of salvation in Christ. And of course, Jesus clearly told us that he hadn't come to change things, but to fulfill them. And so in Christ, both those covenants are the same. Christ is the fulfillment of that Old Testament covenant with God's people. And of course, we believe uh, we are God's people uh, today, and that covenant still applies. As Presbyterians, we believe that it is appropriate for Christian parents to have their children baptized because of that uh, covenant uh, with Abraham. The sign of the covenant back then was given not only to Abraham, who believed, but also to his children. So we believe our children should come within that covenant as well. We've thought about that. We've also thought a lot about the promises and commitments that are made by parents uh, when they bring their children forward for baptism. And of course, that's because um, it is very important to think about that because baptism, infant baptism is given on the basis of the profession of faith of the parents, not the child. Obviously, the child cannot make that profession itself so it's the parents relationship with God uh, which is important in this and as I discussed with the parents and as we've discussed here of course as well the requirement from all parents is a credible profession of faith and what we mean by a credible profession of faith that means not just the words that we say but a profession which is backed up uh, as such with the lifestyle in accordance with Christian values a public commitment to the, the worshipping Christian community. We've thought about that before and, and I talk it through with parents as well. It's that commitment to bringing your child up in the teaching and worship of the church and they can only do that, of course, when we come and be part of the worshipping community. So the responsibility is clearly placed on parents who then make vows in line with all those questions to live up to those vows and promises that they make to God. But uh, you'll know, I always also want to highlight that we all make a promise uh, here today as members of God's family. And we make a promise to order our lives and witness in such a way that we will help the parents to live up to their responsibility. So there is that onus on us uh, as well. Not only just to stand here and to make these professions and these promises with our lips, but to live up to them as well. And so as we come to the different vows and promises, um, that's what I want us to think about. I um, want each of us to think about the responsibility we, we have, as I read the, the short declaration that I always do, about God's blessing 
being on those who make those promises and live up to them. Uh, and then, of course, the opposite being true as well. We can only know and experience God's blessing when we make a promise and then fulfill it. So, to uh, the declaration, and of course, as we say, primarily uh, to you, Kevin uh, and Stephanie, uh, and to you, the congregation gathered here. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of this congregation that in answering these questions, you do so with honesty and sincerity. For be assured that the blessing of God only rests upon those who so promise and then fulfill, whereas the wrath of God is the portion of those who promise lightly or thoughtlessly and neglect to fill their solemn obligations to him. It's all right, Rudy, we're getting there. You're just keen to go. Just waiting to go. So to the first, the first two vows, uh, to Kevin and to Stephanie, and presenting this child for baptism, do you profess your faith in God as your creator and father, in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and in the Holy Spirit as your sanctifier and guide? Do you promise by God's help to provide a Christian home and to bring up this child in the worship and teaching of the church so that he may come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? And to you, uh, the congregation, do you who now in Christ's name receive this child into the fellowship of the church, promise with God's help so to order your congregation a life and witness that he may grow up in the knowledge and love of God and be continuously surrounded by Christian example and influence. Amen. Here comes the bother now. You want to come and see me a wee minute, really? You going to come? Good man. There we are. You'll come with the masks here. Eh? We'll not waste any time, will we, just in case? We're going to get you closer to the bar. Ready? Jack Byrne, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. This child is now received according to Christ's command into the membership of the Holy Universal and Apostolic Church and is engaged to be the Lord's. Will we sing the ironic blessing together? Use all these people. Let's sing the ironic blessing together. Must be my singing. He was okay up there. I started singing there. I know Mark said I wasn't a great singer earlier on, like, but Rudy agrees with you. Um, as always, we, we talk about the best way uh, to, to lead and to guide our children uh, is through God's word. Uh, and so here's your... I look forward to the day that I don't have to wrap these things up. But uh, that's Rudy's uh, little, little Bible. Let's, let's just pray together uh, as, as we close. Let's, let, let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for the joy of this celebration once again. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come and to bring our children to you and to, to baptize them into the fellowship. Lord, we thank you that uh, we are part of your covenant family. And Lord, we thank you that uh, as part of that covenant, we have this joy and privilege of bringing our children into your family as well through this sacrament of baptism. Lord, we pray uh, for Rudy. Lord, we pray that he would grow strong both in body and in mind. And yes, we pray uh, too for his parents, for Kevin and, and Stephanie. Lord, we pray uh, that you would help them, that you would guide them as they seek to bring uh, Rudy up uh, in the teaching of the church. And Lord, we do pray that in your time that he will come to know Jesus uh, for himself, that he will come to know Jesus as Saviour and Lord 
in his life. Lord, as always, we want to pray for all of our households, for all of our families. Lord, we pray that each one, yes, would come to know that joy of a relationship with you. Lord, we pray for your blessing on each house represented here today. Lord, pray that you would help us, lead us and guide us in all things. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to, to sing uh, together now. This is a, a new little baptismal hymn, but it's a very a familiar tune to us all. Um, o God, your life-creating love, the sacred trust to parents gave, in Christ your power came, of, uh, came from above, your children here to claim and save. Um, we'll sing it together, and we'll let Rudy go back to his seat, will we? Uh, and I'll go back up. Let's, let's sing this uh, to God's praise. <clears throat> Congregation, please uh, take, take a seat. We're going to, to bow together in prayer once again this time. Take time to pray together for uh, those within our, our fellowship who we know are struggling with the many different trials and troubles of life. And it's good uh, to pray uh, for our church uh, as well. So it's time. Uh, we're going to, to pause uh, and pray uh, for those situations, for the world around us uh, and uh, for our churches. And as I often say, as God brings those situations to your mind, uh, please bring them to him in prayer. But allow me uh, to lead you in this time of prayer. Let's, let's pray together. Our Father God, we thank you first and foremost for uh, your love for us. That love that has opened this way up for us through Jesus to come and to talk with you in prayer. Father, we thank you that Lord, you want to talk to us and you want us to come and talk to you with all our cares and concerns and our burdens so that we can find the strength and comfort that we need in that love you have for us. And we thank you and we praise you that we can know and love such a great God who has such a desire and concern for his people. We thank you and we praise you that we can come in confidence to God who, who knows each of our hearts, who knows each of our needs. We thank and praise you that it is you, a great sovereign God who is ultimately in control of, of everything, every step we take and every breath that we have in our bodies. So Father, we, we pause and we pray for the many different difficult situations and circumstances each of us know that's, yes, in our own lives and in the lives of those we know and love. As we say, Father, you know our hearts. You know the pain and the sadness we carry in them for those who are ill or struggling with 
anything and everything in life today. Father, pray, we pray that you would help them. That you would lift them out of their trouble and sadness and open into the light of your love. We pray for the ones we know who have gone through treatment or operations in the past days or weeks. Thank you, as we have been doing for some time now, for the, the great health service that you've provided for us in this country. And the success of much of what they do for us. Thank you for the skills and abilities that you've blessed our medical staff with. Or to help us when we most need it. And Father, we pray that you would continue to help them, to guide them, to uphold them as they continue to, to work to bring folk back to health. Now I want to take time to pray for those who are mourning today. And you know there are many known to us who know the pain and hurt of losing someone dear to them. Whether their loss has been in recent days or weeks or some time in the past, you know the the heartache it causes us. And Father, we know from your word, you tell us that you're the God of all comfort and compassion. And Father, we pray that you'd give those who have found themselves in, in that particular dark valley the comfort and peace that they need this particular time. And Father, as we think of the transitory nature of our existence here, in spite of the finality of our life here, we thank you that we can know a confidence that when we're not made for this world, as we focused on right from the opening of this service, there is a glorious eternity that awaits us when we put our faith and trust in Jesus as Saviour and Lord. And so God, we pray for those who don't know the comfort and assurance of that. Pray that they would take the opportunity, even today, to grasp your offer of grace and mercy in each of their lives and they'd be saved. Father, we do want to pray for our church in these days. As we watch the world around us spiral further and further into darkness and away from you and your ways. So many issues these days sexuality, abortion and the likes. We look at our TV screens and we see so much darkness. And we pray, Father, as your people, as your covenant family, in this time and in this generation, we find ourselves in that you give us the strength to stand firm in our faith. You give us the strength to, to speak out and to stand out for you. Father, we want to pray for the vacant congregations in our denomination. Father, we know the, the pandemic has made the process of seeking a, a new minister much more difficult. But we are thankful that things are beginning to move again. We pray especially for the congregations from our own presbytery here. Our own neighbours in the city working doing kingdom work in this city here. Father, we pray that you would help them and guide them as they move through the process. We pray that you would already be preparing the person of your choosing to lead this important work in our little corner of your kingdom. Father, give us a, a vision for your work here in this, yeah, this little corner of your kingdom, this city of ours. Give us a passion for the lost. You give us that enthusiasm to go out with the good news of Jesus, to share the joy. Father, we pray that as we go about our day-to-day -day business in those different places where you have placed us, wherever that may be, or that those around us would catch even a glimpse 
of what it means to be part of your family. They will catch a glimpse of Jesus. So Father, we thank you for this time of prayer. We thank you that you hear both the pleas of our voices and each of our hearts. And so yes, we leave them all. We leave all our prayers and our petitions with you around that mighty throne the confidence we have because we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to stand and sing our next piece of praise uh, together. Uh, we're turning back to our, our Portland Own Psalm book today for our next one. It's uh, the Portland Own version of Psalm 14. The fool has said, There is no God that is his heart's great plight. Uh, said wonderfully to the old tune and as I said, old Sam tune uh, 81 martyred him so let's stand and let's sing this uh, together <laughs> Let's just pray uh, for a moment as we come uh, to God's word together. Let's, let, let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for your word to us. And Lord, we pray that as we turn to it now, that you would still our hearts, that you would open our hearts, soften our hearts, that we might hear your sweet, still voice speaking to us through the pages of your holy word. So speak to us now, we pray, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Ask, uh, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, 
and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. That sounds like a, a wonderful promise, doesn't it? It's one of those statements that we, well, we'd almost say was too good to be true. Whatever we want, no matter what it is, all we have to do is go to God and ask for it. Whatever it might be, we're going to get it. On the surface, that sounds great, doesn't it? Name it and claim it, as they might say these days. All you have to do is ask in faith and God will give you whatever you want. Do you believe me? It's not how it works, sure it's not. We all know that's how it, it doesn't work that way. I'm sure we have all prayed. I'm sure we have prayed fervently even for something at some point or some time or another. And it seems like we haven't got what we want. That's the reality of life, isn't it? Maybe we prayed for, for healing for a loved one. Maybe we prayed for, for guidance in our own lives or, or in our family's lives. But that doesn't seem like what God has given us. Uh, and, and we wonder why. I know I can think of plenty of examples in my own life of times when I have prayed specifically and persistently for something. And well, I'm sure you can add plenty of your own as we talk about it and think about it. You pray. There doesn't seem as if there's any answer. You pray. And what you've prayed for doesn't happen in the way you thought it would or, or you would like it to. We've all been there, haven't we? I'm sure you have. And you're not alone. Let me tell you a story about a guy called Martin Burnham. He was a missionary pilot for the New Tribes Mission in the Philippines. In the summer of 2001, Martin and his wife, Gracia, were captured by uh, the Islamic rebel group, Abu Sayyaf. I hope I've said that right. They were held captive for 376 days. And during the rescue attempt, Martin was killed in the crossfire. And then later, as his wife was reflecting on uh, their ordeal, she wrote these words. She says, sometimes I wonder, why, would, why did Martin die when everyone was praying that he wouldn't? Why does scripture lead you to believe that if you pray in a certain way, you'll get what you pray for? People all over the world were praying that we'd both get out alive. But we didn't. We all know how she felt sometimes, don't we? I know that's a fairly serious example. But we've all been there where we have prayed for something. And we don't seem to get the answer. And we wonder why. But that's not what scripture promises us. The book of Acts, yes, we see many miraculous things in answer to prayer. But we also see many different and what seem like terrible things that seem to be allowed to happen, even though the church, and certainly the church back then, seemed to be on fire and constantly and continually uh, found praying together. And in answer to prayer, Peter is miraculously freed from prison. He prays to be released and an angel comes. Doors of the prison fly open and Peter walks out of the prison unscathed. The angel walking beside him to lead him to safety. Peter is saved because the church prayed for it. And yet a couple of chapters earlier, Stephen, a man who were told was full of God's grace and power, seized by the Sanhedrin and put in trial. And there's no doubt the church was on its knees once again, praying for him. Was he freed? Well, if you know the story, you know the answer, don't we? He was dragged out of the city and stoned to death. We don't always get what we pray for. Everyone who asks, says Jesus, receives. Everyone who knocks, the door is opened. 
as I often say about many different aspects of Christian life and scripture, things like that are easy to say, but hard to understand sometimes. There's a lot we could say about what Jesus is trying to tell us here. But I think our focus today should be on one of the main thoughts right in the middle of the whole thing. And it's what ties those two little short passages together. And it's Jesus' reference to children and to their Father in heaven. What better thing to think of when we have just celebrated baptism and we think of our children than to turn to where Jesus refers to children and to his Father in heaven. And of course the fact that our Father in heaven knows what is best for us and gives us what we need. And emphasize that. Gives us what we need rather than what we want. That's the difference. It's about our faith. It's about having the strength of faith to believe in the assurances that we're given that our Father knows us, that he knows our needs best. He knows better than we do. When we know God is our Father in heaven, we have this, as we've said, this privilege of coming to speak to him any time in prayer and we're assured that he hears us. Wonderful. But we're also told and assured that he knows what is best for us. And that's what we cling to in these times. To illustrate it, gives, Jesus gives us this wonderful image of, uh, of a father who knows his children so well and loves them so much that well, when they ask for bread, he would never even consider giving them a stone. And if they asked for a fish, he wouldn't even think a second about giving them a snake. It just wouldn't happen. It's another one of those almost ludicrous pictures that we've been thinking about in, in, in this, that Jesus gives us to, to point, well, they point the obvious out to us. I mean, we know, humanly speaking, if we care for our family, then we're always going to do what's best for them. And we'll give them what we need or what they need. We don't always give our children everything they want, do we? We give them what they need. And Jesus says that if an earthly father loves and cares for his family so much, how much more, he says, does your heavenly father love and care for you? Friends, the emphasis is on God here. It's not about the man or woman who asks. It is about God, the Father, who knows what we need. Jesus is reminding us that God loves his children and knows how to give them what they need, not what they want. I know I keep emphasizing that, but that's important. It's all about knowing what we need rather than what we want. That's why we get the ask, seek, and knock analogy. Ask, because God wants us to talk to him in prayer. That's the obvious bit, isn't it? It's a great privilege we have and a vital part of our relationship with him. We ask, we go to God in prayer and we ask, but we must seek as well. Ask, seek, and knock. So ask, because God wants us to talk to him in prayer. Seek, because that implies we don't actually know what we really need. We must seek God to find out what we really need rather than what we want. When we seek God, then we'll, we tune ourselves into God as such. And we tune ourselves into God's will. And so we discover what we should actually be looking for and asking for in the first place. When we're tuned to God, we are in the better position to know what to ask for. Ask, seek, lastly, knock. And we must knock because that obviously implies that what we're seeking for and what we're asking for is something that we can't get for ourselves. It is something which is inaccessible to us. So we must go to God, our Father. We've tried and we fail to open the door. But the promise here is that God can and will open that door if it's right for us. If it's right for us. No, we don't always get what we want. But we believe that we get what God knows we need and what's best for us. Folks, I think this paints a, a wonderful, it paints a beautiful picture of a loving, caring father who knows his children intimately. That's the wonderful thing 
about a relationship with God. God knows his children intimately. I know we've said it here before. God isn't some mysterious being away up in the heavens completely detached from his people, from his family. God is in a deep, intimate relationship with his children. It means that as my father, he's interested in me. It means that Learned about me, that he's watching over me, that he has a plan and a purpose for my life. He wants to help me. He wants to bless me, but I must tune myself in to him and to his will. That's what we hold on to. That's what we need to take a firm grasp of. It's this wonderful, intimate relationship we can have with this almighty, all powerful, sovereign God. Friend, if you hear nothing else here today, be assured that whatever happens to you, if God is your Father, the promise here, then the assurance here is that He loves you and is interested in you. And He knows what is best for you. And that leads me into the other half of our reading today. And that's why we're looking at the two passages together. These prayers, these good gifts that God gives to those who ask him, have that prerequisite uh, onto them. And I hope it's a fairly obvious one. To enjoy this privilege of prayer, to enjoy this relationship with the Almighty God, the Father in heaven who knows what you need, not just what you want. You have a choice to make. And that's actually coming to know him as your Father in the first place. You have to have made the choice to seek God and become one of his children in the first place because that, friends, is core to the whole thing. That's why I said, if you know God as your Father a moment ago, and that's why these two passages go together. The privilege of prayer, the privilege of asking and receiving is for those who has made, have made that right choice to begin with. In a couple of verses, Jesus begins to close this sermon with the, uh, the, the first of his, his three comparisons. We'll look at the other two later, the fruitful and unfruitful tree and then the, the wise and foolish builders, the familiar story we all know. But first, this comparison this important comparison between the wide and the narrow road, which presents each of us with a choice that we have to make. Now, we know we have to make choices every day that impact our lives, don't we? Some of the choices are small, and may seem insignificant, but some of the choices we make day by day are important. And they are vital to who we are, and none more than this choice. I'm sure I've quoted this poem from Robert Frost, uh, before called The Road Less Travelled. But let me read you a couple of uh, the verses again. And I'm sorry I could not travel both. And be one traveller long I stood and looked down one as far as I could. Two roads diverged in a wood and I. I took the one less travelled by and that has made all the difference. This seems to have been a defining moment in his life and certainly seems that the choice he made to take the road less traveled by made all the difference. And just like making the right choice that made all the difference in Frost's life, Jesus lays out the choice of two roads for us. And friend, which one you choose will certainly make all the difference for you, for your life now and for eternity. Friend, there are only two roads. And obviously then, only two destinations. And we must choose one or the other. The broad road, which Jesus says many walk down, and certainly many in our world are walking down now, this road that leads to destruction. It only leads to an eternity in hell, separated from God forever. That's where the broad road leads to. And then we have this narrow road, 
with a small gate that leads to life. Jesus is using another analogy of shepherding, isn't he? Referring to the small entrance in the sheep pen which was protected by the shepherd himself. So the shepherd is the gate. The shepherd is the way in. And of course, Jesus is saying that he is the gate that leads to this narrow life or this narrow road which leads to life. You can only find the way to the narrow path by following Jesus. It's that simple. I am the way. Is that what he says? Don't be fooled, friends, that there's any other way. Don't fall into the trap or the fallacy of the world that we're all for heaven no matter what. That's not what the Bible teaches. I remember having a debate in college with a man from another denomination. That's all I'm going to say about him. But he actually said that he believed God had made hell to be empty. That nobody was ever going to go there. That's clearly not what Jesus is saying to us here. That is not what Scripture says anywhere. The warning is clear. There are two choices. There are two roads here. And where you wind up in eternity, friend, is, well, it depends on which road you take now. Follow Jesus or follow Satan. There's no sitting on the fence as far as Scripture is concerned. It's the easy, the broad road, or the more difficult, narrow road. Friends, I'm sure I don't have to tell you that the easy road is called easy for a reason. Seems like the easy choice now, doesn't it? Doesn't demand too much from us. We just go with the flow. We just follow the world. But it offers no blessing spiritually in the here and now and certainly offers nothing from the eternal perspective except separation from God forever. The narrow road, however, that's a different ballgame altogether, isn't it? Yes, it might put some great demands and challenges on our lives in the here and now, but it offers blessings in the here and now as well. And of course, in the eternal perspective, what a blessing. It's been the theme right from the opening hymn. That eternal blessing where this road, this narrow road, opened up by Jesus, opens out further to lead us before the mighty throne of God to join the great choir of saints singing praise and worship to the almighty sovereign God. What a comparison. But friend, the choice is yours. I can't make the choice for you. The elders in this church can't make the choice for you. You have to make the choice. Friend, what choice have you made? What choice will you make? Because you have to choose. You have to choose. You cannot leave this earth without making this choice. If you don't make the choice to follow Jesus, you are making the choice to follow the world and to follow Satan. So you will make a choice one way or another. Which road are you choosing to walk down today? The road to blessing or the road to destruction? The broad or the narrow? Let's pray together. Let's, let's pray. Father, what a challenge your, your word is to us. Father, we have on the one hand this wonderful blessing of the relationship with you where we can come and speak to you in prayer or we can ask, we can seek you and Lord, we know that you will help guide us in your way and your will. And yet then we are presented with this awesome challenge to make that choice. For that blessing of the relationship, that blessing of prayer only comes when we choose Jesus. 
So Lord, we pray for each and every one of us here. Lord, if we have made that choice to follow you, if we have made that choice to accept Jesus as our Savior, Lord, we pray that we would make best use and enjoy that relationship with you. Lord, for those who are tempted by that broad path, who haven't made that decision yet, Lord, we pray that you would speak to them even today. Lord, we can so easily be blinded by what the world has to say. And yeah, as we quoted that man earlier on, that we're all for heaven no matter what. Father, speak to our hearts. Turn us to your path. Turn us to Jesus. That we might know your blessing now and into eternity. Father, speak to each one of us. We commit ourselves to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to sing our, our closing hymn uh, together. Uh, just the, the three verses of it. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It's exactly what we're saying, isn't it? When we seek God, when we seek God's kingdom, when we seek God as our Father, we experience his righteousness and we follow in his ways. And these things will be added to you. Let's stand and let's sing to God. Folks, thank you for joining with us in worship today, whether it's been here in person or online. We do trust you will know God's blessing in the week that lies ahead. But let's close as we always do with our God of love and light prayer. And then I'll close with the words of the benediction. Let's, let's pray together. God of love and light, in this time of fear, give us your peace. In this time of isolation, give us your presence. In this time of sickness, give us your healing. In this time of uncertainty, give us your wisdom. In this time of darkness, shine your light upon us all. In Jesus' name, amen. We pray now the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit would go with each of us both now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>